I'd always been a sucker for the great outdoors. The smell of pine, the rustle of leaves underfoot, the promise of solitude. It was a siren's call I couldn't resist. Today was supposed to be no different. A TikTok video had shown me the way to some rare fungi, and I was hell-bent on finding them. A modern-day treasure hunt, if you will. I parked my truck by the trailhead, laced up my boots, and set off with a sense of purpose. The main trail was familiar, almost comforting, with its well-worn path and occasional markers. But today, I had my sights set on something less traveled, a side trail that promised the kind of adventure you can't find on a map. The moment I stepped off the main trail, I felt it. A shift, subtle but palpable. The air grew thicker, the silence deeper. I shrugged it off, attributing it to the thrill of the unknown. But as I ventured deeper, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. It took me a while to put my finger on it and when I did it sent a chill down my spine. The trees, they were all the same, identical, down to the last twig and leaf. It was as if someone had taken a single tree and copied it, over and over, filling this part of the forest with its clones. It was unnatural, eerie, like walking through a hall of mirrors where every reflection is a towering pine. I should have turned back then, but curiosity is a powerful force. I convinced myself that it was a trick of the light, an illusion born of solitude. I pressed on, my eyes scanning the forest floor for the elusive fungi that had lured me here. But the deeper I went, the more disoriented I became. The identical trees seemed to close in on me, their sameness disorienting, like a maze with no exit. And then, as if on cue, the sky turned. Clouds rolled in, thick and inky, blotting out the sun in a matter of minutes. The forest grew dark, the air heavy with the promise of a storm. I looked up, and through the thick canopy I saw the sky churn with an unnatural energy. Shapes formed and dissolved in the clouds, as if something was roiling within them. Panic set in. I knew I had to get out, find shelter before the heavens broke open. But in a forest of identical trees, every direction looked the same. I was lost, disoriented, a lone wanderer in a forest that defied the laws of nature. Just as I was about to give in to despair, a deafening crack of thunder shook the sky. It was a sound so primal, so terrifying that it jolted me out of my paralysis. I knew I had to move, and fast. I turned back toward what I hoped was the direction of the main trail, my heart pounding in my chest. As I broke into a run, the first raindrops began to fall, heavy and cold, like the fingers of some unseen giant reaching down to claim me. And that's when I heard it a sound that would haunt me for the rest of my life. A wet slapping noise like bare feet on mud, coming from behind me, growing louder with each step I took. I ran, my breath ragged, my fear absolute, knowing that something was coming for me, something born of this cursed forest. And as I ran, the storm broke open, unleashing a torrential downpour that would become my baptism into a nightmare I could never have imagined. The rain was a deluge now, each drop a miniature missile, stinging my skin as I barreled down the trail. The thunder roared again, a monstrous growl that seemed to shake the very ground beneath me. But it was the other sound, that wet slapping against the mud that drove me to the edge of terror. It was getting closer and whatever it was, it was fast. I had no time to think, only to run. The trail twisted and turned, a labyrinth in the darkening forest. My boots slipped in the mud, my breaths came out in ragged gasps. But I pushed on. I had to. The alternative was unthinkable. Then, in a moment that seemed to stretch into eternity, I slipped. My foot caught on a root, and I went sprawling into the mud, my world a blur of earth and sky. For a split second I lay there, stunned, the rain pelting down on me like a shower of icy needles. It was a flash of lightning that saved me. In that brief, blinding moment I saw it. The outline of a cabin, just a few yards ahead. A haven in the storm, a chance for survival. I scrambled to my feet, my body screaming in protest, and lunged forward. But as I did, I heard it again, that wet slapping sound, now accompanied by something new. The crashing of trees, the splintering of wood, as if something or someone was tearing through the forest, obliterating everything in its path. My heart sank. Whatever it was, it was almost upon me. I reached the cabin and practically threw myself against the door, my hands fumbling for a knob, a latch, anything. To my immense relief, the door swung open, and I stumbled inside, slamming it shut behind me. I was in darkness now, 
but it was a darkness I welcomed, a barrier between me and the terror outside. I leaned against the door, my breaths coming out in shallow sobs, my body trembling from exertion and fear. I fumbled in the dark, my hands finally finding a bolt, and I slid it into place with a sense of finality. I was safe, at least for the moment. But even as I stood there, trying to catch my breath, I heard it. The sound of trees crashing just outside the cabin, each thud a seismic event that seemed to shake the very walls around me. And then, above it all, that dreadful wet slapping, now so close, it was as if it were right outside the door. I backed away, my eyes straining to adjust to the darkness, my mind racing. The cabin was my sanctuary, but it was also a trap, a single room with no other exits, no place to hide. I was cornered, and I knew it. And that's when it came, a loud slam against the door so violent it made the whole cabin shudder. A scream followed, a sound so shrill and inhuman it seemed to pierce my very soul. I was not alone, and whatever was out there it wanted in. The slam against the door reverberated through the cabin like a gunshot, leaving a silence so thick you could cut it with a knife. I stood there frozen, my back pressed against the far wall. The bolt held, but for how long? Whatever was outside had just announced its presence with a violence that left no room for doubt. It was strong, and it was angry. I forced myself to move, my eyes scanning the room for anything that could help me. The cabin was a time capsule of neglect. Its wooden walls aged and weathered, its furniture reduced to a single overturned table and a couple of broken chairs. Dust hung in the air, visible in the slivers of light that penetrated the boarded-up windows. It was a place forgotten by time, but I had no luxury to ponder its history. I was writing my own, and it felt like a final chapter. My eyes settled on the windows. They were old, their glass tinged with the grime of years, but they were intact. I moved cautiously toward one, my ears straining for any sound from outside. The rain was still coming down in sheets, a curtain of water that distorted everything. I wiped a small patch clean and peered out, my heart pounding in my chest. Lightning flashed, and for a split second, the world outside was illuminated in stark relief. And there it was, a figure, crouched just beyond the window, its form a grotesque parody of the human shape. But it was the head that caught my eye, a deer skull empty sockets staring back at me. The sight was so shocking, so utterly unnatural, that I stumbled back, a scream catching in my throat. The figure moved, its form blurring in the darkness, and I knew I had been seen. I was out of time. My eyes darted around the room, desperate for a way out. And that's when I saw it, the fireplace. It was old, its hearth filled with the ashes of long-extinguished fires, but it offered a glimmer of hope. Could I fit? Could I climb up and out, escaping this nightmare through the chimney? I had no time to weigh the odds. I lunged for the fireplace just as another slam shook the cabin, this one so powerful it seemed to lift the whole structure off its foundation. I heard wood splinter, nails groan, and I knew the door wouldn't hold much longer. I scrambled into the fireplace, my hands grasping at the brick interior, my feet finding purchase on the narrow ledge. I began to climb, each movement a battle against gravity and fear. I was a few feet up when I heard it, the sound of wood giving way, the crash of a door flying off its hinges. It was followed by a thud, heavy and final, as if something had just landed inside. I froze, my body pressed against the chimney's narrow walls, my breath shallow and rapid. I was cornered, like an animal in a trap, and as I clung there, suspended between hope and despair, I knew one thing with chilling certainty. It was inside, and it was coming for me. My muscles screamed with each inch I climbed, my fingers digging into the soot-covered bricks. I was a few feet up the chimney, but it felt like miles. My mind raced with thoughts of escape, of somehow reaching the top and pulling myself out into the storm. But even that grim prospect was better than facing whatever had just entered the cabin. Then I heard it, the slow, deliberate thud of footsteps on the wooden floor below. Each step was a seismic event, shaking the very foundation of the cabin and sending a fresh wave of terror through me. I held my breath, praying that it wouldn't look up, that it wouldn't discover my desperate hiding place. The smell hit me first, a putrid mix of earth and rot, tinged with the metallic scent of blood. It filled the narrow chimney, choking me, making my eyes water and my stomach churn. I gagged, my body convulsing involuntarily, and that's when I heard it. A low growl, a sound so full of malice it seemed to freeze my very blood. 
I looked down, and through the darkness I saw it, its head thrust into the fireplace, its empty sockets staring up at me. It snarled a sound of pure primal hunger and began to climb. I scrambled higher, my movements frantic, my hands slipping on the sooty bricks. I was running out of chimney, running out of time. My arms ached, my legs trembled, but I pushed on, driven by pure adrenaline and terror. I could hear it below me, its movements slower but no less determined, its growls echoing up the narrow shaft. Then, just when I thought I couldn't go any further, my hand found something. A ledge, a break in the chimney, just big enough for me to crawl into. I pulled myself up, my muscles screaming in protest, and squeezed into the narrow space. I was trapped, cornered, but at least I was out of reach. Or so I thought. I heard it snarl, a sound of frustration and rage, and then, to my horror, I felt it. The chimney walls shaking, bricks dislodging, falling past me in a shower of soot and dust. It was tearing the chimney apart, its strength unimaginable, its determination relentless. I pressed myself into the ledge, my body shaking, my mind numb with terror. I knew I couldn't escape, couldn't climb any higher. I was stuck, and it was only a matter of time. As I sat there waiting for the end, my phone buzzed, its screen lighting up the darkness. Battery low, it flashed, and then went dark. My last link to the outside world, gone. And that's when I heard it. A final triumphant growl, followed by the sound of bricks giving way, tumbling down into the fireplace below. It was coming, its ascent now unimpeded, its victory assured. As I sat there, my body paralyzed with fear, I knew one thing with chilling clarity. I was not alone. I've always felt at home in the woods. The smell of damp earth, the rustle of leaves underfoot, the distant chatter of woodland creatures. It's like a symphony to me. My name's Rick, and I've been hunting in the Ozarks since I was old enough to hold a rifle. But this trip was different. It had a different air about it, like the woods themselves were holding their breath. Jeremiah, my best friend since grade school, was with me. He's Choctaw, and his family's been in these parts longer than anyone can remember. We were packing up my truck, stowing away our 30, 30 Marlins, .44 Magnums, and hunting knives. We had tags for almost anything that moved in the Ozarks, but we were really hoping for an elk or a big buck. As we were double-checking our gear, Jeremiah's mom came out onto the porch. She had that look on her face, the one that said she was about to impart some kind of wisdom that we'd probably ignore. Boys, she began, you know the Ozarks aren't just trees and animals. There are stories, old stories, my parents and grandparents would tell. Yeah, mom, we know, Jeremiah interrupted, rolling his eyes. Sasquatch, shapeshifters, the whole nine yards, she sighed. I'm serious. Be careful out there. Those legends have been around for a reason. We both nodded, more to humor her than anything else. I mean, come on, shapeshifters. This was the 21st century. We had rifles with scopes, for heaven's sake. What could go wrong? We hit the road the truck's tires crunching over the gravel as we left civilization behind. The deeper we went into the Ozarks, the more alive I felt. The worries of school, family, and the future seemed to fade away, absorbed by the towering trees and endless sky. We reached our spot, a secluded area we'd scouted weeks before. It was perfect. A small clearing surrounded by dense forest, a natural corridor for game. We set up our blind, a makeshift structure of camo netting and branches, it wasn't the Ritz, but it would keep us hidden. As we settled in, I couldn't help but think about what Jeremiah's mom had said. I looked over at him. He was cleaning his rifle, focused and methodical. You ever think there's something more out here? I asked. He looked up, locking eyes with me. What do you mean? You know, like what your mom was talking about. Sasquatch, shapeshifters, that sort of thing. He chuckled. Man, those are just stories to keep kids from wandering off into the woods. We've got guns. We've got ammo. What's there to worry about? I nodded, but a small voice in the back of my mind whispered, What if the stories are true? I shook off the thought. We were here to hunt, and daylight was burning. I chambered around into my marlin and peered through the scope, scanning the tree line for movement. Little did I know, the Ozarks had something planned for us something that would make me question everything I thought I knew about these woods. And so, with the sun sinking lower in the sky, 
We waited, but we weren't alone. The sun was a golden disc hanging low in the sky, casting long shadows that danced with the wind. The woods were alive with the sounds of nature, a cacophony that could lull you into a false sense of security. But Jeremiah and I knew better. We were predators in this landscape, but we weren't the only ones. We'd been in the blind for a couple of hours, our eyes peeled for any sign of game. The anticipation was like electricity, buzzing through my veins, making every sense heightened. That's when I saw it. A flash of tawny fur, a ripple in the sea of green and brown. Over there, I whispered, nodding toward the spot where I'd seen the movement. Jeremiah shifted his position, his eyes following the line of my gaze. I see it, he murmured. Mountain lion. My heart pounded in my chest. A mountain lion was a rare sight, and a dangerous one. But we had tags, and we had the firepower to take it down. This was the kind of story you'd tell for years, the kind of hunt that made legends. Jeremiah shouldered his marlin, his finger hovering over the trigger. He took a deep breath, steadying his aim. I held my own breath, as if that could somehow help him make the shot. Time seemed to slow down, each second stretching out, taut as a bowstring. And then, the mountain lion moved. It wasn't a sudden dash or a leap. It simply walked behind a tree, its tail flicking out of sight like a wisp of smoke. Jeremiah let out his breath, his finger easing off the trigger. Damn, he muttered, lost the shot. We waited, our eyes glued to that tree as if we could will the animal to reappear. Minutes ticked by, turning into hours. The sun dipped lower, the light fading, turning the world into a canvas of grays and blacks. But the mountain lion didn't come back. You think it knew we were here? I finally asked, breaking the silence. Jeremiah shrugged. Animals are smarter than we give them credit for. Maybe it sensed something was off. Or maybe it was something else. Something we couldn't understand. I thought back to the legends. The stories of shapeshifters and creatures that walked between worlds. It sounded crazy, but out here, in the gathering dark, anything seemed possible. We should pack up, Jeremiah said, breaking into my thoughts. It's getting too dark to shoot. I nodded, but as we started to gather our gear, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. It was like a prickling on the back of my neck, a whisper in the wind. I scanned the tree line one last time, half expecting to see a pair of glowing eyes staring back at me. But there was nothing, just the trees and the shadows, and the secrets they kept. As we left the blind, I took one last look at that tree, the one where the mountain lion had disappeared. And for the first time, I wondered if Jeremiah's mom was right. Maybe there were things in these woods that defied explanation, things that existed only in the space between legend and reality. And maybe, just maybe, we had come closer to that space than we'd ever wanted to. The next morning broke clear and crisp, the air tinged with the scent of pine and damp earth. We were back in the blind, rifles at the ready, but the atmosphere was different. The events of the previous day hung over us like a cloud, unspoken but palpable. I was scanning the tree line, my eyes still not fully trusting what they saw, when Jeremiah nudged me. Look, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. I followed his gaze and saw it, a bobcat emerging from behind the very tree where the mountain lion had vanished. My mind raced. Bobcats were common enough in the Ozarks, but this was something else. This was the same spot, the same eerie feeling of being watched. That's not right, I muttered. It can't be the same animal. Jeremiah shook his head. I don't know, man, but something's off. The bobcat seemed to hear us. It turned its head, its eyes locking onto ours. Those eyes were a deep yellow, almost golden, and they seemed to bore right into my soul. Then, as if making a decision, the bobcat started walking toward us. My heart pounded in my chest. Bobcats usually avoided humans. They were solitary creatures, more likely to run than confront. But this one was different. It moved with purpose, as if it had something to prove. It stopped a few yards from the blind, right under the window where we'd set up our rifles. It crouched low, its body coiling like a spring, its eyes never leaving ours. Jeremiah, I said, my voice shaky. Do something. He didn't need to be told twice. He grabbed his .44 Magnum and aimed it at the bobcat. 
I'm going to give you to the count of three, he said, his voice steady. One, two. We both held our breath, waiting for the inevitable. The bobcat seemed to sense what was coming. Its muscles tensed, its eyes narrowed. And then, just as Jeremiah was about to say three, the bobcat relaxed. It stood up, turned around, and walked away, as if it had made its point. But before it vanished into the woods, it looked back over its shoulder, its eyes meeting ours one last time. It was a look I couldn't describe, a mix of defiance and something else, something almost human. We sat there in stunned silence, our weapons forgotten, our minds racing. What had just happened? What had we just seen? Was that a warning? Jeremiah finally asked, breaking the silence. I don't know, I replied, but it felt like one. We packed up our gear, our movements mechanical, our minds elsewhere. As we left the blind, I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd crossed a line, that we'd ventured into a world we didn't understand. And as we made our way back to the truck, I thought about the legends, the stories of shapeshifters and creatures that defied explanation. I thought about the warning from Jeremiah's mom, the one we'd ignored. And I realized, maybe for the first time, that there were things in these woods that were beyond our understanding, things that existed in the shadows in the space between the known and the unknown. And whether we liked it or not, we were now a part of that world. We were back at my place, the walls closing in after the vast openness of the Ozarks. The air felt heavy, saturated with questions we didn't want to ask. Jeremiah had left, muttering something about needing to talk to his mom. I was alone, staring at the screen of my laptop, my fingers hovering over the keys. I'd started to research the legends, the folklore that we'd laughed off as mere stories, shapeshifters, skinwalkers, beings that could change their form at will. The more I read, the more the pieces started to fit, like a jigsaw puzzle revealing an image too unsettling to contemplate. The bobcat, the mountain lion, the inexplicable feeling of being watched, they all pointed to something beyond the realm of the natural, something that defied explanation. And the most terrifying part? These beings were said to mark those who'd seen them, to claim them as part of their world. I was so engrossed in my research that I didn't hear the sound at first. A soft scratching, like claws against wood. It was coming from outside, from the direction of the woods. My heart started to pound, each beat echoing the sound that was growing louder, more insistent. I grabbed my .44 Magnum from the table, and made my way to the window. My hands were shaking as I pulled back the curtain, my eyes scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. And then I saw it, a pair of eyes, glowing in the dark, staring right at me. I aimed my gun, my finger trembling on the trigger. But before I could shoot, a voice echoed in my mind, as clear as if someone were standing right next to me. You are marked, it said. You are one of us now. I staggered back, my gun slipping from my grasp. The eyes vanished, swallowed by the darkness, but the message was clear. I was marked, claimed, a part of a world I'd never wanted to enter. My phone buzzed, breaking the silence. It was a text from Jeremiah. We need to talk, it read. Mom says there's something we have to do, a ritual to cleanse ourselves. She says it's the only way to break the mark. I started to type a reply, my fingers fumbling over the keys. But before I could hit send, another message popped up on my screen. It was from an unknown number, a string of digits that made no sense. Don't bother, it read. You're already one of us. My blood turned to ice, my fingers freezing over the keys. The room seemed to cluck was in, the walls pulsating like a living thing. And in that moment, I knew. The legends were real, the mark was real, and my life, as I knew it, was over. I heard the scratching again, louder this time, more insistent. It was coming from the door, from the other side of the thin barrier that separated me from the darkness. And as I sat there, paralyzed by fear, I realized the terrifying truth. I was not alone, and I would never be alone again. My Uncle Jack and I had been hunting these Illinois woods since I was old enough to hold a rifle. We knew every deer trail, every thicket, every hollow like the back of our hands. But familiarity can sometimes breed a dangerous sort of confidence, the kind that makes you forget that even well-trodden paths can hold secrets. 
It was deer season, and the woods were alive with the promise of a good hunt. Uncle Jack and I had spent the day checking tree stands and marking new trails. Poaching had been a problem in these parts, and we wanted to make sure we had the upper hand this season. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple, we called it a day. I headed home, my mind already drifting to the hunt ahead. The phone rang just as I was cleaning my rifle. It was Uncle Jack. Hey, I think I dropped my wallet somewhere in the woods, he said, his voice tinged with annoyance. You mind taking a look? You're closer, and it's gonna be dark soon. I glanced at the clock. 8 p.m., late, but not too late. Sure, I'll go take a look, I said, my voice more eager than I intended. A chance to be back in the woods? I'd take it, lost wallet or not. I grabbed my flashlight and headed out, my truck's tires crunching on the gravel road that led to our usual hunting grounds. The woods welcomed me like an old friend, its towering trees forming a dark canopy against the night sky. I switched on my flashlight, its beam cutting through the darkness as I retraced the trail we'd walked earlier. As I moved deeper into the woods, I couldn't shake off a nagging feeling that something was off. The air felt heavier, as if charged with static, and the usual night sound seemed muted, distant. I shook my head, chiding myself for letting my imagination run wild. I was about to turn back when my flashlight beam caught something unusual on the ground, a patch of freshly disturbed earth, as if something had been digging. Curiosity peaked. I moved closer, my senses on high alert. That's when I heard it, a soft rustling sound, like the whisper of leaves in the wind, but different, more deliberate. I swung my flashlight around, its beam darting from tree to tree, but there was nothing, just the dark, impenetrable woods staring back at me. I took a deep breath, steadying my nerves. It's just the woods, I told myself. You've been here a thousand times. But even as the words left my mouth, I knew something had changed. These woods were no longer the sanctuary I had always known. They had become a labyrinth of shadows, hiding secrets that I was not sure I wanted to uncover. I turned back, my steps quickening as I made my way to my truck. Uncle Jack's wallet would have to wait. Right now, all I wanted was to put as much distance as possible between me and whatever was lurking in those woods. As I reached my truck, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone, that something was watching me, hidden in the darkness. And for the first time in my life, the woods felt like a place where I did not belong. I drove away, but the unease stayed with me, a dark cloud hanging over my thoughts. I knew I would have to go back, but the thought filled me with a dread I had never felt before, because I knew that these woods were hiding something, something that I was not sure I was ready to face. I couldn't shake the feeling that last night had left me with. The woods had always been a second home, a sanctuary, but now they felt like a maze with walls closing in. Still, Uncle Jack's wallet was out there, and I couldn't let my newfound apprehensions keep me from doing a simple favor for family. I waited until daylight had fully settled in before heading back. The sun was a reassuring presence, its rays filtering through the canopy of leaves, casting dappled shadows on the forest floor. Daylight makes all the difference, I told myself, gripping the flashlight in my pocket, just in case. I retraced our steps, my eyes scanning the ground for that familiar piece of leather. I reached the spot where I'd turned back the night before, the patch of freshly disturbed earth. It looked different in the daylight, less menacing, but I couldn't shake off the unease that tightened in my chest. That's when I saw it, a figure in the distance, hunched over, sniffing the ground. My heart skipped a beat. A poacher? No, this was different. The figure moved in a way that was almost animalistic, its motions too fluid, too deliberate. I felt a chill crawl up my spine as it lifted its head, as if sensing my presence. For a moment, our eyes locked, and a wave of dread washed over me. This wasn't just some lost hiker or a poacher, this was something else, something I couldn't, didn't want to, identify. My fight-or-flight instincts kicked in hard. I turned and bolted, my boots pounding against the earth, every snap twig echoing like a gunshot in my ears. I didn't look back, I couldn't. The only thing that mattered was the growing distance between me and whatever that thing was. As I neared my truck, a guttural scream ripped through the air, echoing through the trees. It was a sound I'd never heard before, a sound that no animal I knew could make. 
It was as if the woods themselves were crying out, warning me, urging me to go faster. I reached the truck, my hands trembling as I fumbled with the keys. Just as I slammed the door shut, something, someone, rushed past me, a blur in the corner of my eye, disappearing into the other section of the woods. I jammed the key into the ignition and turned, half expecting to see that figure emerge from the trees, but there was nothing. As I drove away, my heart still pounding in my chest, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd escaped something terrible. But what? My mind raced through the possibilities. A ghost, a demon, a skinwalker? I didn't know and I wasn't sure I wanted to find out. The woods had always been my sanctuary, a place where I felt most alive. But now, they felt like a tomb, hiding secrets darker than the shadows that danced between the trees. As I left, I looked in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that figure standing in the road behind me. But there was nothing, just the empty road and the towering trees, their branches swaying in the wind as if waving goodbye. I knew then that these woods would never be the same for me. And as I drove away, I couldn't help but wonder, what else was out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to venture too deep? Years slipped by like water through a sieve, but the memory of that night in the woods remained, lodged in my mind like a splinter I couldn't remove. I'd taken to hunting in different areas, places where the trees didn't seem to whisper secrets, and the shadows didn't dance with hidden figures. But the woods have a way of following you, even when you try to leave them behind. It was my Aunt Sarah who brought it all rushing back. She lived closer to those woods, in a house that bordered the fields, leading to that tangled maze of trees. One evening she called me, her voice tinged with a nervous energy I'd never heard before. I saw something, something I can't explain, she said, pausing as if searching for the right words. It was a figure, all black, walking in the field, but its head, its head looked like that of a crow. I felt a chill creep up my spine, a haunting echo of the dread I'd felt years before. Did it see you? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. I don't know, she replied, but when I looked again, it was gone, just vanished. Not long after that call, a fire broke out in the woods. It raged for hours, consuming acres of trees and underbrush, as if trying to cleanse the land of some unspeakable evil. The firefighters managed to contain it, but the damage was done. The woods were scarred, changed, as if bearing the physical manifestation of the darkness I'd always felt. But it didn't end there. Aunt Sarah started hearing things. Voices that whispered in the wind. Strange noises that echoed in the night something tapping on the walls of her house. Even her dog, Max, seemed to sense something, growling at unseen threats and pacing restlessly through the house. We need to do something, she said when she called me again. I can't live like this. I'm putting up cameras around the house. I agreed, more for her peace of mind than any real belief that we'd catch something on film. But deep down, a part of me hoped we would that we'd finally get some tangible proof of the darkness that lurked in those woods. We spent a weekend setting up the cameras, positioning them to cover the fields, the edge of the woods, and the perimeter of her house. We tested them, made sure they were working, and then we waited. It didn't take long. Just two nights later, the cameras triggered, motion sensors picking up something that moved in the field, near the edge of the woods. My heart pounded as I clicked on the video file, my eyes straining to make out the shape that flickered on the screen. For a brief moment it was there, a shadowy figure, its form indistinct but unmistakably real. And then the screen went black, the file corrupted, unreadable. We caught it, Aunt Sarah said when I called her, her voice tinged with both relief and fear. We caught something, but even as she said it, I knew we'd caught nothing at all. Whatever haunted those woods had shown itself, but it remained elusive a darkness that refused to be caught in the light. And as the screen flickered back to black, I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd only scratched the surface of something far deeper, far more terrifying than we'd ever imagined. The corrupted video file sat on my computer like an unopened letter from a long-lost friend, both inviting and foreboding. I tried every trick in the book to recover it, but it was as if the file itself resisted being viewed. Finally, I had to admit defeat. The cameras went offline shortly after, their lenses clouded as if touched by some unseen hand. 
They never worked again. I couldn't shake the feeling that we'd poked the bear, stirred something that should have been left alone. Aunt Sarah felt it too. She sold her house, moved to a small apartment in town, far from the whispering woods and haunting fields. But you can't escape something that doesn't want to be escaped. I took to hunting in other places, far from those cursed woods. But no matter where I went, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that I was the one being hunted now. The woods had eyes, and those eyes had followed me. Then came the call that I'd been dreading. It was from a local hunter, the guy I'd met a few times at the local bar. He'd been out near those woods, the ones I'd sworn never to return to. You should come see this, he said, his voice trembling. There are holes, man. Fresh holes, like someone's been digging. My heart sank. The old legend about the man who killed his wife and buried her in those woods, searching for the money she'd hidden, flashed through my mind. The low spots, the freshly disturbed earth, it all connected in a horrifying clarity. I met him near the woods, my hands shaking as I parked my truck. We walked in silence, the weight of our unspoken fears as heavy as the rifles slung over our shoulders. And then we saw them, holes freshly dug, the earth upturned as if in a frenzied search for something. Look, he said, pointing to one of the holes. Inside it was a wallet, old and weathered, its leather cracked and faded. It was Uncle Jack's. As I picked it up, a scream echoed through the woods, a guttural, inhuman sound that froze my blood. I looked up, and for a brief moment I saw it, the figure, its eyes glowing in the dim light, its form an indistinct shadow that seemed to absorb the very darkness around it. And then it was gone, vanished into the depths of the woods, leaving nothing but the chilling echo of its scream and the haunting emptiness of its gaze. I dropped the wallet my hands trembling, my heart pounding in my chest. We turned and ran, our feet barely touching the ground, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. We didn't stop until we reached the truck, and even then, the feeling of dread remained, a dark cloud that hung over us like a shroud. As I drove away, my eyes caught a glimpse of something in the rearview mirror, a figure standing at the edge of the woods, watching. I don't know what haunts those woods, ghost, demon, skinwalker, or something far worse, but I do know this. It knows me now, knows that I've seen it, that I've touched a piece of its dark world. And as I drove away, leaving those cursed woods behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that a part of it had followed me, a shadow that would forever linger at the edge of my life, waiting for the moment when it could step fully into the light. I've always been a believer in the things that lurk just beyond the veil of our understanding. Maybe it's the Mexican blood that runs through my veins, or the countless nights I spent as a kid listening to my grandma recount tales of La Llorona and El Chupacabra. So, when my brother Alex decided to move to Kirtland, New Mexico, to finish his college degree, I couldn't shake the feeling that he was stepping into a landscape ripe for the inexplicable. Kirtland wasn't just any town. It sat across the river from a Native American reservation, primarily occupied by the Danae tribe, or as most folks know them, the Navajo. My grandparents had been living there for years, their home a cozy but aging structure that had seen better days. I helped Alex pack up his old Ford truck, throwing in boxes of textbooks, clothes and that old guitar he never seemed to play, but refused to leave behind. Take care of yourself, Hermano. I said, slapping him on the back as he climbed into the driver's seat. Don't I always? He grinned, his eyes alight with the kind of youthful excitement that comes from embarking on a new adventure. The drive from Kansas to New Mexico was a long one, but Alex said it was uneventful. He called me the moment he arrived, his voice tinged with exhaustion, but also a hint of awe. This place is something else, man, he told me. There's a kind of stillness here, a quiet that makes your skin prickle. He settled into life quickly, enrolling in classes at the college in Farmington, a neighboring town, and even landing a part-time job at a hardware store. It was a small, family-run place, the kind where the paint on the signs had started to chip and fade but nobody really minded. The store was frequented by locals, many of whom were Native Americans from the reservation. Alex was a social guy, always had been, and he soon struck up friendships with some of the regulars. 
they talk about all sorts of things from the weather to local politics. But what really caught Alex's attention were the stories they'd share. Ghost stories, legends, tales that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. Only a select few ever mentioned the word skinwalker, and when they did, their voices would drop to a whisper, as if saying the word too loudly might invoke something terrible. Man, you wouldn't believe the stories these guys have, Alex told me one evening over the phone. Makes you wonder what's really out there, you know? I chuckled. Well, just remember, curiosity killed the cat. Yeah, but satisfaction brought it back, he retorted, and we both laughed, comfortable in the knowledge that whatever was out there, it was simply part of the grand tapestry of life's mysteries, or so we thought. As April rolled around, the days growing longer and the nights warmer, a sense of normalcy settled over Alex's life. Classes, work, the occasional night out with friends. It was easy to forget that he was living in a place where the boundary between the known and the unknown seemed so permeable. But all that was about to change. Late one night, as Alex sat in his room watching TV, he heard it a sound that would shatter his sense of normalcy and plunge him into a world he had never imagined existed. And that was just the beginning. The clock on the wall read 11.17 p.m. I was sprawled out on my bed, half watching some late night talk show, when I heard it, a soft scraping sound like gravel being shuffled in the driveway. My first thought was that it was grandma maybe letting the dog out for a late night bathroom break. But then it hit me. It was way past her bedtime. She'd be sound asleep by now. I muted the TV, straining my ears. The sound came again, closer this time, more deliberate. A shiver crawled up my spine. I got up and tiptoed to the window, my heart pounding in my chest like a drum. I parted the blinds just enough to peek through. What I saw out there froze me to my core. It was crawling across the driveway, this thing. It had hind legs like a bear, a torso that seemed to ripple with muscle, and a head that was canine but not quite. Its snout was shorter more grotesque, and its eyes, those bright yellow eyes seemed to glow in the darkness, locking onto something I couldn't see. For a moment it stopped, as if sensing that it was being watched. Then, in a movement that defied all logic, it rose. It stood up on its hind legs towering over the ground and sniffed the air. I felt like it was sniffing for me. I was paralyzed, caught in some sort of trance I couldn't explain. My mind screamed at me to move, to close the blinds and back away but my body wouldn't listen. I was locked in its gaze, those yellow eyes piercing through the night, through the window, through me. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it dropped back onto all fours. With a speed that seemed impossible for its size, it darted toward the property gate. It didn't jump over it, didn't break it down. It crawled over it, its body contorting in ways that made my stomach churn. And then it was gone, swallowed by the darkness. I stumbled back from the window, my legs weak, my breath shallow. What had I just seen? Was it a figment of my imagination, a trick of the light? Or had I come face to face with something otherworldly? I grabbed my phone and dialed my brother's number. It rang once, twice, then went to voicemail. I hung up, my hands trembling. I needed to tell someone, to share what I'd seen, but the words caught in my throat. Who would believe me? Hell, did I even believe myself? I sat back on my bed, my eyes darting to the window every few seconds. The TV host was laughing at some joke, the audience joining in, a world so blissfully unaware of the darkness that lurked just beyond the veil of our understanding. I knew one thing for certain. I had stepped over that veil tonight, and there was no turning back. Whatever this was, whatever I had seen, it was only the beginning. And the most terrifying thought of all, it knew I was here. I didn't sleep a wink that night. Every creak of the floorboards, every rustle of the wind against the window, sent my heart racing. By the time dawn broke, painting the sky with hues of orange and pink, I was a mess of frayed nerves and unspoken fears. I went to work that day like a zombie, my movements mechanical, my interactions forced. The hardware store was busy, a constant stream of customers needing help with this or that. But my mind was elsewhere, lost in the haunting images of the previous night. Hey, you okay? It was Tom, a Navajo guy who'd been working at the store long before I got there. He was older, maybe in his fifties, with a face that looked like it had seen its fair share of hard times. I hesitated, unsure of how much to reveal. Had a rough night. 
I finally said, opting for vagueness. Tom looked at me, his eyes narrowing. You saw something, didn't you? The directness of his question caught me off guard. What makes you say that? He leaned in closer, lowering his voice. This land, it's old, filled with stories and spirits that most people don't understand, but sometimes they make themselves known. I felt a chill run down my spine. Like a skinwalker? Tom's eyes widened and he quickly made the sign of the cross. Don't say that word out loud, it's bad medicine. But you know what I'm talking about? He nodded, his face grave. I do, and if you've seen one you need to be careful. They're not to be taken lightly. I told him about the creature I'd seen, about its yellow eyes and the way it had sniffed the air, as if searching for something, or someone. When I finished, Tom was silent for a long moment. Sounds like you had a close encounter, he finally said. You should speak to a medicine man, get some protection. Protection? You mean like a talisman or something? Something like that. But more importantly, you need to understand what you're dealing with. These beings, they're not just legends or folklore. They're real and they're dangerous. I thought about my grandparents' house, about its proximity to the river. Is it true that they use rivers for rituals? Tom nodded. Water is a conduit for spiritual energy, both good and bad. If your grandparents' house is near a river, it could be a pathway. A pathway for what? For them to enter our world. I felt my blood run cold. So what do I do? First, speak to a medicine man. Second, be vigilant. These beings, they're cunning, manipulative. They'll try to trick you, to lure you into their world. And then what? Tom looked at me, his eyes filled with a mixture of fear and sadness. Then, you'll be lost. Forever. As I left the store that day, Tom's words echoed in my mind, filling me with a dread that was as palpable as it was intangible. I was entangled in something far greater and more terrifying than I could have ever imagined. And the worst part, I was in it alone. Mid-May brought with it a sense of celebration. My graduation was a milestone, a beacon of hope in the midst of the chaos that had become my life. My family, ever supportive, made the journey to Kirtland. We laughed, shared stories, and for a brief moment, I allowed myself to forget the terror that lurked in the shadows. We set up a pop-up camper behind my grandparents' house. It was cozy, filled with the familiar sounds of my cousin's laughter and the comforting aroma of my grandmother's cooking. That night, as the stars painted the sky, we sat around a campfire, the warmth of the flames warding off the chill of the desert night. But as the embers died and we retreated into the camper, a sense of unease settled over me. The darkness outside seemed thicker, more oppressive. I tried to shake off the feeling, attributing it to the stories and warnings that had consumed my thoughts in recent weeks. I was jolted awake in the dead of night by a soft, almost inaudible sound. It was a rhythmic tapping, like fingers drumming on a window pane. My heart raced as I remembered the creature, its yellow eyes and its haunting presence. I lay still, hoping it was just a dream. But then, my grandmother's voice pierced the silence. Who's out there? She whispered, her voice trembling with fear. I sat up, straining my ears. The tapping had stopped, replaced by a soft, almost melodic humming, it was a tune I recognized, one my grandmother used to hum to me as a child. But this was different, distorted, as if coming from far away. I mustered the courage to peek out of the window. The moonlight bathed the yard in a silvery glow, casting eerie shadows on the ground. And there, standing in the middle of the camper, was a silhouette. It was tall, its frame reminiscent of my uncle's. But there was something off about it. It stood still, its head tilted, as if listening. My grandmother's voice broke the silence again. It's watching them, she whispered, her voice filled with terror. I followed her gaze to the trailer where my cousins and uncle slept. The silhouette was now closer, its form clearer in the moonlight. It was not my uncle. Its limbs were too long, its posture too unnatural. And its eyes, those familiar yellow eyes, stared intently at the sleeping forms inside. Frozen in fear, I watched as it leaned closer its breath fogging up the window of the trailer. It seemed to be studying then, its head tilting from side to side as if trying to understand. And then, in a swift, fluid motion, it turned its gaze to our camper. Our eyes locked, and a cold dread washed over me. It knew. It knew I had seen it, that I was aware of its presence. 
With a guttural growl, it lunged at our camper, its form blurring in the darkness. I screamed, the sound echoing in the still night, but before it could reach us, it vanished, leaving behind only the chilling memory of its presence. The next morning we found the trailer empty. My cousins and uncle were gone without a trace. The only evidence of their presence was the fogged up window and a single chilling message written in the condensation, we are always watching. The terror of that night will forever haunt me, for I know that somewhere out there, in the shadows, they are waiting, watching, and one day they will come for me. I turned 16 on a hot June day, the kind where the air sticks to your skin like a second layer. Birthdays had lost their shine over the years, but this one felt different. 16 meant freedom, or at least the promise of it. But freedom was still a year away, I couldn't drive yet. So I decided to spend my newfound maturity visiting my sister Morgan in Cleveland. Morgan had moved to Cleveland a couple of years back, chasing some dream job in marketing. She lived in a small house with creaky floors and an attic that smelled like old books and mothballs. It was a far cry from the sprawling Wyoming landscapes I was used to, but it was a change, and at 16, any change felt like an adventure. Morgan was seven years my senior, the responsible one, with a boyfriend named Nate, who had a beard and drove a pickup. Nate was okay, a bit too serious for my taste, but he treated Morgan well, and that was what counted. I'd been in Cleveland for a few days, mostly confined to the attic Morgan had converted into a makeshift guest room. It was hot up there, the kind of heat that makes you feel like you're breathing through a wet cloth. I passed the time playing GTA on an old console, the sounds of virtual car chases filling the small space. It was a way to kill time, nothing more. Morgan worked most days, and Nate was often busy with whatever it was he did for a living. So, it was a surprise when they both showed up in the attic one evening, beers in hand, with a proposal. How about we go light some fireworks for the fourth? Nate asked, scratching his beard as if pondering the complexities of the universe. There's a secluded park not far from here. Could be fun. I looked up from my game, pausing to consider the offer. The attic was stifling, and the thought of spending another evening up here was less than appealing. Plus, fireworks meant a break from the monotony a chance to feel like a normal teenager, if only for a night. Sure, I said, setting down the controller. Why not? Morgan grinned, her eyes lighting up in a way I hadn't seen in years. Great, it's a plan then. As they left the attic, I couldn't shake the feeling that this 4th of July would be different. Maybe it was the promise of fireworks, or perhaps the simple joy of doing something, anything that broke the routine. But deep down, a small voice whispered that this adventure would be unlike any other. I shrugged off the thought, attributing it to the overactive imagination of a bored 16-year-old. But as I'd soon find out, some instincts are better left unignored. The night was warm, the kind of summer evening that makes you forget about the passage of time. We piled into Nate's pickup, the engine rumbling to life like a beast waking from slumber. Morgan sat shotgun, flipping through her phone, while I claimed the back seat, my eyes fixed on the darkening horizon. Nate drove with a steady hand, his eyes focused on the road as if he were deciphering some hidden message in the asphalt. We left the city lights behind, venturing into the outskirts where civilization gave way to untamed land. The road twisted and turned, leading us deeper into the wilderness. We're almost there, Nate announced, breaking the silence that had settled over us like a thick fog. It's just past this hill. As we descended, the world around us seemed to change. The sky turned a deeper shade of black, as if someone had thrown a dark cloth over the moon and stars. The headlights cut through the darkness, two beams of light in an ocean of nothingness. That's when I saw it, a deer standing by the side of the road, its eyes catching the light in a way that made them glow an eerie yellow. But before I could get a good look, it vanished. One moment it was there, and the next, it was gone as if swallowed by the night itself. I blinked, trying to make sense of what I'd just seen. Deer were common in these parts, but something about this one felt off. Its eyes had glowed in a way that seemed almost unnatural, and its disappearance was too swift, too silent. You okay back there? Morgan asked, her eyes meeting mine through the rearview mirror. 
Yeah, I said, forcing a smile. Just thought I saw a deer is all. Morgan shrugged, turning her attention back to her phone. But Nate glanced at me, his eyes narrowing as if he were weighing my words. We drove in silence for a few more minutes, the tension in the car thickening like quicksand. Finally, we reached a parking lot, a small patch of civilization in the middle of nowhere. Nate pulled in, killing the engine. We're here, he said, a hint of excitement creeping into his voice. I looked out the window, taking in our surroundings. We were parked next to a large field, the tall grass swaying gently in the night breeze. On the other side was a dense forest, its trees standing tall like ancient guardians. As I stepped out of the car, a chill ran down my spine. The air had turned cold, a stark contrast to the warmth of just a few minutes ago. I wrapped my arms around myself, trying to shake off the sudden drop in temperature, but the chill remained, clinging to me like a second skin. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone, that something was watching us from the shadows. I glanced at Morgan and Nate, but they seemed oblivious, caught up in the excitement of the night. As Nate began setting up the fireworks, I couldn't help but wonder if we were making a mistake. But before I could voice my concerns, a loud pop echoed through the air, signaling the start of our 4th of July celebrations. And so, with a sense of foreboding hanging heavy in the air, we stepped into the unknown, blissfully unaware of the eyes that watched us from the darkness. Nate wasted no time. He pulled a box of fireworks from the back of the pickup and began setting them up in the field. The air was thick with anticipation, each of us lost in our thoughts as we waited for the show to begin. Morgan was busy capturing the moment on her phone, her face illuminated by the soft glow of the screen. I leaned against the car, my eyes drifting to the forest that bordered the field. The trees stood like dark sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind. It was a peaceful scene, but the tranquility did little to ease the sense of unease that had settled over me. The temperature had dropped noticeably since we arrived, and I found myself shivering despite the warm clothes I was wearing. It was as if the very air around us had changed, growing colder, denser, as if warning us to leave. Ready? Nate called out, lighting the fuse on the first firework. A loud pop echoed through the air, followed by a burst of color that lit up the night sky. For a moment, all thoughts of unease were forgotten as we watched the display, our faces lit up by the vibrant hues of the fireworks. But as the last firework exploded in a shower of sparks, the sense of foreboding returned, stronger than before. I looked around half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows, but there was nothing, just the empty field and the dark forest beyond. That's when I heard it, the sound of breaking branches, followed by heavy footsteps that seemed to come from the forest. My heart began to race, each beat echoing in my ears as I strained to hear over the sound of my own breathing. Did you guys hear that? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Hear what? Morgan replied, her eyes meeting mine. Those footsteps, I said, pointing toward the forest. Something's out there. Morgan laughed, dismissing my concerns with a wave of her hand. You're just being paranoid. It's probably just an animal. But as she spoke, I saw it. A silhouette in the tree line, barely visible in the darkness. It looked like a deer, but there was something off about it. From what I could make out, it was standing on its hind legs, its eyes fixed on us as if watching, waiting. We should go, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Something's not right. Morgan rolled her eyes, clearly unconvinced. You worry too much, just relax and enjoy the night. But as we climbed back into the car, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were making a grave mistake. The eyes that had watched us from the forest seemed to bore into me, filling me with a sense of dread that I couldn't explain. As Nate started the engine, I took one last look at the forest, half expecting to see the creature emerge from the shadows. But there was nothing, just the empty field and the dark trees beyond, their branches swaying gently in the wind as if waving goodbye. And so, with a heavy heart, we left the park, each of us lost in our thoughts as we drove back to Cleveland. But as the city lights came into view, I couldn't help but wonder if anything had followed us home. The pickup's engine roared to life, shattering the silence that had enveloped us. Nate shifted into gear, and we began the ascent up the hill, leaving behind the field, the forest, and whatever it was that had been watching us. 
Morgan seemed lost in her own world, her fingers dancing over her phone screen as she scrolled through social media. Nate was focused on the road, his eyes scanning the darkness ahead as if expecting something to leap out at us. I sat in the back, my mind racing, my eyes darting to the rearview mirror every few seconds. John, you've been quiet, Morgan finally said, breaking the silence. You okay? I hesitated, unsure of how to put my unease into words. I just think we should have left sooner, I finally said. Morgan chuckled. You're such a worrywart. What's the worst that could have happened? I wanted to tell her about the eyes I'd seen, the footsteps I'd heard, and the inexplicable chill that had settled over me. But I held back fearing she'd dismiss it as the overactive imagination of a 16-year-old. As we drove, the city lights of Cleveland began to appear in the distance, like stars breaking through a cloud-covered sky. It should have been a comforting sight, but it only intensified the feeling that we were bringing something back with us, something dark and malevolent. We're almost home, Nate announced as we entered the city limits. I nodded, forcing a smile, but my eyes were drawn to the rearview mirror one last time. For a split second I thought I saw something, a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the road, watching us as we drove away. But when I blinked, it was gone, leaving me to wonder if it had ever been there at all. As Nate pulled into the driveway, I felt a wave of relief wash over me. We were back, safe and sound, in the heart of civilization. But as I stepped out of the car, I realized that the sense of dread that had gripped me in the park had not dissipated. It had followed me home. See you inside, Morgan said, giving me a playful nudge as she headed toward the front door. I nodded, forcing a smile, but my eyes were drawn to the trees that lined the property. They stood tall and imposing, their branches swaying gently in the night breeze, as if whispering secrets to one another. As I made my way inside, I couldn't shake the feeling that we had been part of something much larger than ourselves, something we couldn't understand or explain. And as I closed the door behind me, I knew that whatever it was, it wasn't over. It was just beginning. And so, with a heavy heart, I climbed the stairs to the attic, each step taking me further away from the events of the night, but not from the sense of foreboding that had settled over me. As I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, I couldn't help but wonder what we had left behind in that park and what, if anything, had followed us home. The attic was a sanctuary of sorts, a place where I could escape the complexities of the world below. Morgan joined me and we settled in to watch some late night TV. The room was filled with the soft glow of the screen, casting shadows that danced on the walls like restless spirits. I left the window open, welcoming the night breeze that usually carried the comforting sounds of Cleveland distant traffic, the occasional laughter of people enjoying the summer night, crickets singing their endless songs. But tonight, the air that flowed through the window was different. It was colder, heavier, as if carrying the weight of unseen eyes. As we sat there engrossed in some forgettable show, I realized that the usual sounds of the city had vanished. The room was enveloped in an eerie silence the kind that presses against your eardrums, demanding to be acknowledged. Do you hear that? I finally asked, muting the TV. Hear what? Morgan looked at me, puzzled. The silence, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. It's too quiet. Morgan laughed, dismissing my concerns with a wave of her hand. You really need to stop worrying so much. It's just a quiet night, that's all. But before I could respond, a sound pierced the silence a loud, unnatural whistling that seemed to come from all directions at once. It was a haunting melody, one that seemed to resonate with the very air around us, filling the room with a sense of impending doom. Do you hear that? I asked, my eyes meeting Morgan's. Hear what? She replied, clearly not sharing my experience. The whistling, I said, my voice tinged with urgency. Tell me you hear it. Morgan shook her head, her eyes narrowing as if questioning my sanity. I don't hear anything, are you sure you're okay? But as she spoke, the whistling grew louder, its melody twisting and turning like a snake searching for its prey. It was as if the sound was coming from everywhere and nowhere at the same time, a ghostly symphony that defied explanation. Unable to bear it any longer, I rushed to the window and closed it, shutting out the night air and the haunting melody that filled it. 
but even as I latched the window, I knew that it was too late. Whatever it was that had been watching us, that had followed us home, was already here. I turned to Morgan, my eyes searching hers for some sign of understanding, some acknowledgement of the terror that gripped me. But there was nothing, just the blank stare of someone who had not heard the whistling, who had not felt the chill in the air, who had not seen the eyes that watched us from the darkness. And as I lay in bed that night staring at the ceiling, I knew that I was alone in my fear, isolated by an experience that defied explanation. But as the clock ticked toward morning, one thing became clear. Whatever it was that had found us, it had no intention of leaving. And so, with a heavy heart and a mind filled with questions, I closed my eyes, praying for a sleep that I knew would not come, and a peace that seemed forever out of reach. The morning light filtered through the attic window, casting a golden glow on the room. It should have been comforting, a new day wiping the slate clean, but the events of the previous night hung over me like a dark cloud, refusing to be forgotten. Morgan had already left for work, leaving me alone in the house. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The air still felt heavy, as if charged with an energy that I couldn't see but could definitely feel. I decided to go downstairs, make some coffee, try to act normal. But as I descended the steps, each creak of the wooden floor seemed to echo unnaturally, as if the house itself was warning me. I reached the kitchen and started the coffee maker. The familiar gurgling sound it made was oddly reassuring. That's when I heard it, the whistling. It was back, but this time it was coming from inside the house. My heart pounded in my chest as I followed the sound, each note guiding me like a siren's call. It led me to the front door. Taking a deep breath, I opened it. There was nothing there, just the empty driveway and the trees swaying gently in the morning breeze. But then I looked down and saw them, hoof prints leading right up to the doorstep and then disappearing, as if the creature had vanished into thin air. I slammed the door shut, my hands trembling. It was real, all of it, the deer-like creature, the whistling, the sense of dread, it was all real. And it had found me. I retreated to the attic, locking the door behind me. I sat there for what felt like hours, my eyes fixed on the window. The daylight was fading, giving way to the dark of night, and as the room grew darker, so did my thoughts. That's when I saw it, the face at the window. It was the deer-like creature, its eyes glowing an eerie yellow. But it was the expression on its face that terrified me the most. It was smiling, as if savoring a secret that only it knew. Before I could react, the creature let out a whistle, the same haunting melody that had filled the air the previous night. But this time the sound was accompanied by words, whispered so softly that they were almost lost in the wind. We see you, it said, its voice tinged with a malevolence that made my blood run cold. And then it was gone, disappearing into the night as quickly as it had come. But its words remain, echoing in my mind like a curse. I was left with a sense of dread that no morning light could dispel, a fear that clung to me like a shadow. I knew then that I was not alone, that I would never be alone again. And as I lay in bed that night staring into the darkness, I realized that the most terrifying thing of all was not the creature or the whistling or the eyes that watched from the shadows. It was the unanswered question that haunted me, a question that I feared I already knew the answer to. What did it mean when it said, we see you? And so, with a heart filled with terror and a soul forever scarred, I closed my eyes, praying for a sleep that I knew would never come, and a peace that had been shattered beyond repair.